17 of their last 21 games, including 10 and 3 since Yusuf Nurkic went down with that compound leg fracture. Been really good lately, and that includes a 3 1 lead over the Oklahoma City Thunder. They got the, the whiteout going in Portland tonight as they try to close out that series. And guys, Sometimes the simple stat is the telling one, and in this series, three-point shooting has been a pretty good barometer, which is a pretty bad sign for OKC. The Thunder have struggled from three-point range for literally years now, and in each of Portland's wins so far, the Blazers have also outshot OKC from outside the arc. Yeah, Portland's biggest strength is OKC's glaring weakness, and it's been that way uh, since this OKC team has lost Kevin Durant. I mean, that's a long time mm -hmm. for one franchise not to address their biggest weakness. And so for me in this series, on the road, OKC is shooting 16%. Mm. And where are they playing at tonight? Uh, not at home. Not at home. So they're, they're in for a dog fight tonight. I just think Portland's shooters are very comfortable right now. Not only Damian Lillard, but uh, CJ McCullough. Farouk Aminu is shooting at a high percentage. Yeah, he was great in game Mo four. Oh, Harkless. I mean, they have just shooters galore, not to mention they got a Curry on the roster. So <laughs> their shooters are of plenty, and they're most comfortable at home, and they're at home tonight. So I think it's just going to be a, a, tough, a tough hill to climb for, for OKC. They'll put up a valiant effort, but shooting at the end of the day will prevail for Portland. I I interesting enough, you got to credit Portland's front office. The last two playoff runs, it gets come playoff time, and teams have just zoned up on, on Damian Lillard and essentially said, dare one of the other guys to beat you. So they go out and get a guy by the name of Seth Curry, and now the floor is spread. Now you cannot go out and help. And as you talked about, Al Farouk Aminu has a big performance. And if you look at Oklahoma City's front office, the one thing I, I do love is the development of Ferguson and Grant. Those two were essentially, you want, I want to say, non-shooters, and they worked and worked to develop them, and their three-point percentage has raised in the regular season. Yeah. But in the postseason, they're tough because, Jet, those are guys, I'm going to stay on the nail, then I'm going to close out late to those three-point shots. But if it's a Curry, I'm not leaving him. I'm right. not even going to help because he's going to burn me. Yeah, there's not the same kind of space for Paul George no. and certainly Russell Westbrook to operate. While Portland is shooting better than 41% from three, for the series so far, it's such a huge part of the game. Well, you mentioned Durant. Since he left town, the Thunder are 4-13 and 13 over the last three mm. postseasons. Westbrook has yet to shoot 40% in a single series. And more of the same so far against Portland. So, guys, what has to change for Russ in particular and for the Thunder tonight if they're going to get out of Portland and send this series back to OKC? Look, they're going to have to bring a lot of effort and a lot of attitude. And the one thing I don't see from Oklahoma City, they're not on the same page. I see great intentions from every member of the Thunder, whether it be Russell, whether it be PG uh, or Steven Adams. But as a collective unit, they look like they're on different pages. Damian Lillard will come off of pick and rolls, and sometimes Russ is sitting back and lets Dame shoot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Russ is doing the right thing and trailing over, because I'm trailing every screen, Jed. He shoot just like you. You got to trail those screens, and the bigs will be way back in the paint. And the one thing you got to take your hat off to is Coach Terry Stotts. Because when you guard Damian Lillard in that point, in that system, the one thing you never know what's going to happen. There's a lot of misdirections. And as a, me, as a, as a big or a center in that system, you're always bumping the flare, dropping back and protecting. And as soon as you drop back, your man's sprinting into a pick and roll. I cannot say the same for the Oklahoma City Thunder. It's a big, glaring problem. Yeah, who would have guessed that Ennis Cantor – formerly of OKC, would be out playing Steven Adams to this point. Yeah, he, he's definitely came to play, and you can see he plays with a chip on his shoulder. Obviously, this is the team that traded you, uh, but it's, it's just a tough matchup. I mean, Steven Adams, look, he's having to chase C.J. McCollum and Damian mm -hmm. out at 30 feet. Right. I don't know one big <laughs> in this league right. that can do so with effectiveness. So it's just a, a tough matchup for him, but I will tell you this. If they can make this game chippy, if they can fight, if they can scrap, hey, get one of these guys ejected, Damian Lillard, get him into <laughs> altercation, that's going to be the best chance they're going to have tonight. And, and again, Russell Westbrook's going to have to get a triple-double. Paul George will have to go for 40-plus. And maybe Ferguson yeah. or Grant yeah. can make over 50% from three. There's been no shortage of chirping throughout the series. It hasn't really escalated beyond that to this point. But we'll see what kind of fight OKC comes with tonight. That's later on in Portland. Looking at Kyle Lowry. And the Raptors can create some rest for themselves before their second-round series. A closeout chance against the Magic tonight.
guy is something else. In franchise history, the Raptors are five and six in closeout games. Their first shot at wrapping things up with the Magic comes tonight in Toronto, and that's where we find Steve Smith will be on the call tonight here on NBA TV with Kevin Ray, Mike Fratello, and Jared Greenberg. Smitty, good to see you. Uh, since that game one Orlando win, the Raptors have been dominant, particularly their defense. With the additions of Kawhi Leonard, Marcus Gasol, a couple of defensive players of the year, Danny Green as well, all since last summer. How well suited is this defense for a deep playoff run? Well, Matt, you said it best. You saw the accolades from some of these veteran guys, and then you throw in a Pascal Siakam. He's long. He's active. He's a guy that can get out and run and create havoc defensively. But I think it's also their schemes. Nick Nurse talked about whenever Vucevic has the basketball, they play him straight up with Marcus Gasol. They dig a little bit with Serge. But anybody else, they're coming on a hard double. Interesting, Terrence Ross, they top sighting him, he said, on all down screens, all dribble handoffs, they're going to double him. And pick and rolls with the basketball with Terrence Ross, they're doubling. They think he's the key to giving them energy and knocking down three-point shots. Smitty is Jet. Hey, um, can, can Orlando do anything similar to what they did in game one to try to extend this series and get this thing back to Orlando? Jet, great question. Uh, and, Steve Clifford talked about turnovers. He said, we can't turn the basketball over. They're so good defensively, we must get shots. And he said he thought rebound, especially in Orlando, they gave up so many second-chance points, especially in game four um, on the offensive glass for the Toronto Raptors. So he said if they could rebound, not turn it over, and obviously they want to hit some shots, but they also want to keep the pace down. They want the games to be close into like 100, 105, no more than 105. He feels they have a chance if they can do that, Jet. Smitty, what does this team need out of Kyle Lowry? We've seen who Kawhi is. We've seen Pascal. But who does Kyle Lowry have to be for the Toronto Raptors to have success? You know, Ryan, I think um, for this series, I think you can play this way. But I think going further on, they need all-star Kyle Lowry. They need a guy that can come out and put his imprint all over this game. And we know he's going to give that effort defensively. I'm not worried about that. He's sharing the ball well. But, Ryan, you said it best. What do they need from Kyle Lowry to ultimately get to the Eastern Conference Final and get to the championship? I think they need all-star Kyle Lowry's offense, and I think they need him to be confident on that side of the ball on the offensive end. A moment ago, you mentioned what Toronto was doing defensively to Nikola Vucevic. The Magic All-Star has averaged just 12 points and shot under 35% so far. Is it a matter of Toronto just making the decision they're going to take him away and Orlando's going to have to adjust, or is there something Vucevic can do to produce a little more and, and help the Magic or help the Magic rather survive tonight? Matt, Steve Clifford talked about that they, they don't really run plays for Vucevic. They like him to just duck in to play basketball. But they said now they want him to go quick. They're going to try to move him, pick and rolls, maybe have him come up higher against Marcus Hall on the post and have him faced up a little bit more. But they just want Vooch to be Vooch. If he's going to have double teams, collect the double teams, kick out. He's making the right passes. He said they need to make shots. The wing guys for order for him to loosen up the defense, for him to get loose on down on the block. Smitty, if you're, uh, if you're Orlando, what's more important for them? Is it Terrence Ross getting off to a, a good start or them getting out in transition where they were so effective this season? What do they need to do to have success? You know what, Ryan? We haven't talked about Aaron Gordon. Aaron Gordon is a guy they're not double teaming. So I think Aaron Gordon, he has played solid. He's played his averages in the regular season. But this is where in the playoffs, as you know, Ryan, and Jet knows this, they need him to have one of those games. He need a 24, 25-point game, rebounds, knocking down three. He has shot the three better on the road, around 71% versus at home. I think they need Aaron Gordon to have a big game for them to win this one. Uh, Aaron Gordon was uh, big in game four, but it wasn't enough. We'll see if they can turn the tide tonight in Toronto. Smitty, we'll see you at the top of the hour right here for the broadcast. Appreciate you guys. All right, Thanks, time for winning ingredients presented by Papa John's. Toronto has found the formula for shutting down the magic offense, holding them to 91 a game on 39% shooting. And guys, since game one, Orlando has shot just 26% from three-point range. Here's Toronto head coach Nick Nurse. Nick, uh, Mike Grange from Sportsnet. Any particular points of emphasis based on, I mean, as well as you guys played defensively, is there anything that jumps out and you're still trying to tidy up? I think they had like 13 open threes or something like that. They missed a bunch of them. But. Um, well, I think uh, 
the main emphasis is tonight is to try to do it over the course of the 48 minutes. I think, uh, you know, from watching all the other series, um, or teams have three wins already, you know, the Celtics took maybe the lead for the first time with about four minutes to go. <clears throat> Detroit was up 12 last night. Uh, Utah didn't go away, uh, on and on. So I think, um, I mean, there's no nothing specific, Michael. I just think that, again, we, we need to do some of the, the things we've been doing really well, which is get our defense set up. Transition defense has been great. I think that will be an early indicator of, of if we're – engaged in wanting to play the same type of defense we've been playing. Um, I think we've been excellent at um, keeping the ball more under control. Um, but when it isn't under control, we've been excellent at helping each other. Um, so nothing, nothing outside of pretty basic stuff, you know, with effort. And um, that, again, uh, understanding that it needs to be done over the full 48 minutes. Anyone else? Doug. Yeah, Nick, Doug Smith, the Toronto Star. You, you've been able to turn them over at a much higher rate than they're used to giving it up. Is, it, is that just your length and quickness, or to what do you attribute that? Well, it, yeah, we've, we've done a really good job, Doug, of getting our hands on a lot of passes. Um, just deflections have, has been way up. But I just think that, that most of that starts with really good ball pressure. I think we're speeding them up a little bit in the half court a little bit more than they're used to. Um, and, you know, when you're sped up, it gets a little harder to, to make plays or see the next play. Or And, again, I think I think we're covering up maybe what looks really, you know, like, like the first option looks good and we cover that one up and now you're going to option two or three and then you're maybe a little bit, your decision making's not quite as good. But, yeah, our length and stuff has, has a lot to do with it too. John. Nick, uh, John Didden, OrlandoMagic.com. Uh, players hate comparisons, but uh, Siakam, Isaac, kind of similar body types, play the same position. Did you see signs that, that this was coming from Pascal? The last year in the playoffs, he played 10 games? Well, we, we um, thought he was going to be much improved this year coming out of the, the, the season and the summer that he had and just the way he looked. Um, every time we went to see him this summer and then training camp, et cetera, just looked like he was going to have. But I'm not sure anybody saw all this coming, right? I mean, this is – if any if anybody said the guy was going to do what he's doing in the playoffs a year ago from, from now, they were really being optimistic, all right? So he's been really good. You know, he got off to a fast start. Um, I think we were kind of, I was kind of waiting to see if he would maintain a level of consistency and be able to do that because I think that's still the sign of are you here for real is can you do it night in and night out. And then there's all these little, you know, little kind of benchmarks along the way. How's he going to, how's he going to play after the All-Star break? How's he going to play the full 82? And, and then you get to this part, what's he going to do in the playoffs? Apparently, he's going to continue to thrive. Speaking of Pascal Siakam, on the way here in game time, an earth-shaking anniversary for Shaq. A wild game three in Brooklyn. The Sixers are back at home tonight, hoping to send the Nets home for the summer. Still no word on the availability of Joel Embiid, who's dealing with that knee issue. Embiid, of course, has been a formidable force in this series. Making shots, erasing shots, and twice so far delivering shots worthy of flagrant fouls. But so far, at least, he hasn't broken any equipment. 26 years ago, today, that's exactly what happened when Shaquille O'Neal ripped down the backboard at Meadowlands Arena in New Jersey. Ro Parrish talked to Shaq about that unforgettable scene as well as previous backboard casualties in this edition of Storytime with Shaq. <laughs> Another spectacular moment in your career also took place in New Jersey when you tore down the entire basket. Stanchion, backboard, all that got torn down. Uh, number one, what, was there anything that was different that day? You seemed to have some extra strength. Was there anything that you did that was different than the normal routine? I always had to put myself in anger mode to play at the highest level. Dwayne Shinsis, 
rest in peace. Never met him, never had anything against him, but he went to Florida. So now I got that SEC war thing going on in my head. So when I get it, I got to, you know, make, make my mark felt. Uh, the rim was probably weak because if you look at the dunk, it wasn't really a powerful dunk. I did go up strong because I know he was behind me. Can't let a guy from the SEC block it. So I went up extra strong. And when I pulled on the rim, I admit I did get some extra um because I wanted to because I wanted to dunk and pull myself up and swing the leg and be like, ah. But when I did that, the thing started falling, so I had to release. And when I ducked down like this, I was like, please don't fall on me. And then I was getting ready to pick my head up, and that damn shot clock hit me in the head. But see, when you get hit in the head in front of everybody, you can't act like it hurts. You gotta play it off. So when it hit me, I was like, but then when I got to the time, I was like, damn, man, I need some icy hot. <laughs> damn, shoulder, damn, shoulder broke. Orlando, last game, Dennis Scott was starting. Bowie was coming off the bench as oh. he follows it almost and does bring down the entire oh. backboard. That's one we haven't seen. There was another situation earlier in that season where you're out in Phoenix. Charles Barkley's there watching. And I hated Charles Barkley. Not to the point to where I disliked him. It was, it was a karate mode thing. You know, we talked about this before that. Uh, growing up, I watched a lot of karate movies, and the basis of those movies are the young master must take out the top master. And Barkley is a legend, right? But I wanted Spot. Magic Johnson's a legend. I wanted Spot. Jordan's a legend. All these guys are ahead of me. I want their Spot. They hurt my name, but now you have to feel the name. So every time I got the ball. I wanted Charles Barkley to know who Shaquille was. And if you go back to the footage, I'm, I, I want you to play it slow. When I dunk, Charles does this. And that's exactly what I want. Like, when you pulling it down, you see Charles go like this. And now I'm working with his fat ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, what is the actual count? I've, I've done my research. I know you broke one at LSU. I've seen a pickup game where you tore one down. I've seen the two that you had in the NBA. Your actual count is six. The actual rims that I've broke are all in my gym in Orlando. I have five homes, and in front of each home, I've planted a broken rim tree. And this is, you know, in, in commemoration, in memory of the rims that I broke. So going to the broken rim conversation. Now, is there any player since you've left the game in the NBA, outside of the NBA, that you think could do something similar, maybe break a rim, bring down? Is there anybody that you've seen? Early on, there was a kid that played in Orlando by the name of Dwight Howard. I thought he was close. And then I think the injuries probably took toll on him and he wanted to do other things. But if he had that killer focus, he would have been one that definitely could have got it done. Because like early in Orlando, when he was playing for Van Gundy, he was definitely a monster. I think Joel Embiid is the one guy in the league right now who potentially could bring down yeah. a rim. But if you're talking about guys of that size and that power, it's a good reminder that as NBA players, it's not a bad idea to just sort of stay out of their way because oh. those, those are not normal humans. No, you definitely want to get out of the way. But I got a little nugget for you. In a 10-year career, Gus Johnson of the Baltimore Bullets uh -huh. shattered three backboards. Really? Daryl Dawkins. Daryl Dawkins did it. Chocolate Thunder, right? Yep. Multiple backboards. Yeah. But Shaquille O'Neal is the only NBA player to break a whole basket. Right. That's unheard of. Well, they put in the breakaway that, rim at some point, so you right. couldn't just shatter the backboard. Right. But nobody's easily. breaking the whole goal. Like, yeah, bringing yeah. in a whole nother goal, right. like, never. It never happened again. I don't care. Embiid may be a rim, but not a whole basket. Yeah. yeah Embiid's not bouncy enough, but what was interesting, like, when you think about Shaq, like, they had to reinforce the rims. You know what? Like, like, it, it's just so – it's not normal. I, I think now <laughs> we would maybe have to measure, you know, size and, and force and impact on the rim to see if it's even possible to Ow. do what Shaq was doing. I, I remember uh, my rookie year at, at oh. training camp, I brought down the goal, but there was like a screw loose or something going on. <laughs> even, like Shaq said, it wasn't even a good dunk, man, if you you just hit that thing at the right time. But look, I mean, look how old that is, oh, though, Jet. man. <laughs> Shaq's like he doesn't have a screw Yo. loose after getting hit in the head with the, the shot clock there. As a, as a kid, I swear, that was, like, the greatest thing. Like, Shaq, like, he was on – I had, like, ten Shaq photos, posters all on the wall, man. <laughs> uh, that was 26 years ago today. But that was the regular season, by the way, the second to last game of the regular season, which was going – Deep well, that was into good. April back. That Ooh. was a good thing, man. Yeah. They didn't really need any more baskets at that point. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. All right, more coming up here. We'll take a look at the late game tonight. A chance for Dame Lillard and the Blazers to finish off the Thunder tonight in Portland.